I'm going to take your Bibles, go to the book of Philemon, if you would. The book of Philemon got started in this little book last week and continue our study here. Last week we focused in on Philemon himself and Paul's recognition of that great trait of Philemon, and that was this, he was a refreshing brother. Uh, the Bible says there at the end of verse 7 uh, there that he says, uh, the bowels of the saints are refreshed by the brother. Uh, obviously, uh, in their day and age, bowels was, uh, was what we would call the heart. We often talk about uh, your heart and, and the affections uh, being from your heart and everything. That's not what they used back then. They considered the midsection of a person. That's the bowels, if you will. And so that was the center of them. And so that was that place of the emotions. And so we find there that, um, that Philemon's refreshment was just not something that was just out, outward uh, physical thing, but it was an inward refreshing uh, that it was that when you walked away from him, your spirit uh, was helped by being around Philemon. And so he had been a tremendous blessing to many saints in the church as well as Paul. But as we mentioned last week, uh, his great test of uh, his refreshing, if you will, or of his encouragement would be presented to him now. If you can picture the setting, Paul has sent this letter to Philemon, but it was Onesimus who was delivering the letter. And no doubt as, that, as he walked through the door in the courtyard that day and he had a letter in hand, I can see Philemon as his countenance would just drop. Like, oh man, you're back. You know, and boy, oh, I wait till I get a hold of you kind of a thing there. And I can see Onesimus quickly saying, this is from Paul. <laughs> you know, and I can almost see Philemon as he takes the letter from him and incredulously looks at him. And opens that letter up and begins to read. And, and sure enough, it's Paul writing this here. And so sure enough, it's, it's his stuff. And, and he starts to lay it on uh, there. You know, man, you're such a good man. You're such a well-beloved man. And man, I love you. And boy, you're such a blessing to the saints. And you're a blessing to the church. And my, 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 we can't find a better brother in the world than what you are, Philemon. And I could almost see, I don't know if Philemon was kind of soaking it in or if Philemon was like, Okay, what's the catch? Well, tonight's the catch. Okay, uh, if you will, uh, Philemon is uh, about to find out exactly what uh, what was going to uh, happen or what was the uh, the crux of the letter coming here, and it comes down to this: Would he extend the same kindness to him? Talking about Onesimus as he had to the other believers. And that was where Paul was coming uh, to him here uh, with that. And as we think about that, just remember this. Everybody that you know has a past. Everybody in this room, you have a past. And we understand that uh, that past uh, many times for those of us, uh, uh, we personally, we know what that past is, but a lot of times we like to hide parts of our past because it's, it's not too pretty. And we don't want anybody to know about those things, if you will. And, and the truth of the matter is, most of us don't know about each other's past. Yeah. And th there may be a few in here that you know a little more than others, but for the most part, we really don't know each other's past, and therefore we have an easier time accepting each other. Yeah. It's those people that we know really well that we really have a hard time with, isn't it? You know, and that's exactly where, where what we're dealing with here in this letter is this here is this is, is, is that uh, knowing somebody uh, well, it's harder for us to show grace to them. But isn't that really truly the test of our Christianity? The ability to extend grace to those who we know best, but especially to those who have hurt us personally. Philemon had been hurt by Onesimus, not just the fact that he ran away. Look at me here. We're going to look at these other verses here, but I want you to see here verse number 18. Paul says this, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. Let's just say there wasn't a matter of if here. 
Onesimus had run away from Paul, or from Philemon, and so therefore there was that uh, robbery of him. It is said that a, a common uh, slave or servant at that time would have cost about uh, 500 denarius, and that was, uh, denarius was one day's pay. So you kind of do the math there. Uh, you figure out what your pay is for a year, and you multiply that by 1.5, and you get what about a slave is going to cost. So if you make 50000 a year, we'll just use a nice, easy, round number. That means they were paying uh, somewhere around $75,000 for a, a, a servant to be in their house, a common one. I read somewhere where somebody who was skilled in their abilities or they were very intelligent and able to help that they could cost upwards to 500,000 denarius. So take that 75,000 and multiply it by 1,000, you've got 75 million. So you understand here that whenever this man ran away, he wasn't just running away here for his life. He was, uh, and, and in that day and age, they were considered uh, to be property. And so uh, this man here is taking a financial hit by him leaving, but it is also believed that he stole from Philemon. And so he took off with uh, valuables as well. So uh, this man here has done some, uh, some very severe things here. And so now here's Paul writing to him. And he, as, as Philemon looks at Onesimus, try to put yourself in his place. Here's a man who has taken advantage of him and who has, who has stolen from him. And he's standing there in this presence now. And he's asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness, and that's where that's the crux of the uh, here of the of the of the letter here, if you will, the midsection we're going to look at tonight, beginning at verse eight. Now, Paul here uh, he he begins this uh, part by making a request. Okay, there, the the request is going to be made here in verses eight and nine. But notice how Paul lays it out in verse eight. There he says, "Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient." You say, what in the world is he saying there? Here's what he's saying. Philemon, I could demand of you and require of you as an apostle of Jesus Christ to forgive this man and to wipe away his debt. That's what he's saying. I could do that. And by the way, the apostle, being an apostle, could have invoked his authority. He could have said uh, one of those, you know, uh, it reminds me of this here. My brother would often do things like this here whenever he would get in trouble around town. Some of you know this here. Maybe you had experience with this. He would say something like this here. Do you know who my dad is? And he thought that got him off the hook for everything. It didn't, you know. Uh, but that was kind of where Paul was saying. He said he, could, he was, could have been saying this here. Hey, do you know who I am? I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. And because of that, he had that authority. But Paul doesn't use that. Uh, he doesn't uh, use that authority, if you will, to, to hammer things out. Rather, uh, he's, he's going to ap apply for something else. He's going to uh, uh, push on him to do it out of love. Instead of this here, uh, the, 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 uh, the Bible expositor John Phillips, he laid it out this way. I thought it was very well uh, written. He said, a person can be made to follow a given line of behavior for one of three reasons. Out of a sense of discipline, out of a sense of duty, or out of a sense of desire. Discipline says, I have to. Duty says, I ought to. Desire says, I want to. And what Paul was trying to get Philemon at here was this here was not, well, I'm going to do it, but I ain't going to like it. He didn't want him to have that attitude. He didn't want him to have the attitude either of, well, I'm a Christian. <clears throat> I don't have a choice. He didn't want him to do it that way either. He wanted him to do it because, because of what Christ Jesus has done for me. How can I hold anything against somebody else? Because the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. And that's where Paul was pushing Philemon. He, I want you to do it out of a sense of love. Um, I, I wrote this down here. Authority should be used sparingly when dealing with relationships. Relationships need to be built on truth and love, not duty and requirement. 
Listen, if you're going to, if your kids, if the way you're, you're bringing your kids up is they better do what I say and they, and they are, they're doing what you say out of fear. Listen, they'll, they'll maybe do what they're supposed to while they're in the house, but the second they leave, they're going to completely ignore you. And that's the last thing you want. You want them to do things because they love you. That, that's what you want. You want them to do things because they trust you and, and because that is a long lasting thing. And I'm not saying there's not times whenever uh, duty does call and we do things out of duty because I'd rather, you know, I don't want to, but, you know, there, I, you know I, I always didn't listen to my dad because I loved him. Most of the time I did, but sometimes there were times I just did it because I didn't want to get whooped. Simple as that. I didn't like what I was doing, but I knew the alternative was worse. And so I did it out of duty. But the most part, most of the time, it wasn't out of that. It was because I had a desire to please my dad. And that was out of a heart of love. And that's what Paul was, was uh, pushing here uh, with this here. Uh, uh, Ironside said it this way, where the grace of Christ rules in the heart, I command becomes I beseech. And that's exactly what Paul does. Look what he says there in verse 9. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee. I, I could require this of you, but rather I'm going to ask you here for love's sake, if you will, it's an opportunity to show a proof of your love. Your love is proven not by your words, but by your actions. You can say I love you all day long, but if, you, if, there, if there's nothing that backs up those words, your, your words mean nothing. We find that out in the political season, don't we? There's a lot of promises made, but there's a lot of, there are very few promises kept. And listen, as a believer, that should not be the case. And so Paul here is saying, uh, you want to uh, put your, your love on display. Let's see what the real proof of your love is here at Philemon. And listen, uh, he's going to do some appealing to the emotions, to the heart here of this man. Notice what he says next. Uh, Yet for love's sake, I beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged I'm an old man. Can't you do me a favor? Many believe that Paul is about 60 years old at this time. And you say, well, 60 is not very old. Well, what Paul's been through, he may have been 60, but he probably looked like he was 90. If you, want to, if you want to know why, go and rehearse yourself there. I believe it's in, uh, I can't remember if it's 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, but he goes through that whole list of all the things he's, uh, he's endured, uh, beaten with rods three times, uh, stripes on his back five times, uh, leapt in the deep a night and a day, uh, been shipwrecked, uh, shipwrecked three times. Uh, he's got the care of the churches on him. I mean, he just goes through this litany of things of, that is on him and just the stress that he dealt with and the physical abuse he dealt with. Uh, he had that thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that is, but man, he is dealing with a lot of stuff and that old body, boy, it is just beat up. And so he sees it. Yeah. Philemon, I'm just an old man. <coughs> would you, for an old man, would you do this? A kind of, it's kind of a rotten way to do things, isn't it? But no, you know what? What is he doing? I, I can see this as Philemon's reading this, and I can see as, uh, as Apphia and, and Aristarchus are looking over his shoulder going, he's right, he is an old man. I mean, this would be kind of nice for him to do. Yeah. You can kind of see maybe a little bit of melting going on, but now also notice here the next thing he says, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Don't forget I'm in prison too. I can't come there and stand with, with Onesimus and make his case because I've been in prison for the cause of Christ. Could you do this one thing for me? I am begging you to show love to this young man. Quite the appeal, right? Quite the appeal. And so we have this all laid out for us uh, here as he's, he's, he's trying to soften the heart of Philemon. Now we're not given any indication of what Philemon's reaction is. We have no idea. We don't know if he was upset. We don't know if he was hard. We don't know what it was. But Paul is writing this here because, remember, he just can't pick up the telephone and say, hey, I need to talk to you. He's writing a letter, and he's trying to, he's trying to convey to him as best he can, Philemon, I need you to do something that is driven by the spiritual side of you. 
I need you to set aside the cultural side. I need you to set aside the pressure of, of the business here. I, I need you to set aside all those things. And I need you to let the love of Christ reign in your heart right now. Don't forget. Don't forget who, who's writing this. Don't forget who brought you to Christ. So he, he's making a strong appeal here, right? Notice here the second thing that we find here. We find the request made, but now in verses 10 through 14, we have that rescued brother presented now. All this time he's been building up to this here. And in verse 10, the Bible says, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, we put things in a certain way here in English, but as Paul was writing this, he actually saves Onesimus' name for the very end. I mean, he gets everything out to where he has this, and he leaves Onesimus. So hey, he's saying there, I beseech you for my, 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 my son Onesimus, so I be gone in my bonds. I, 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 I want you to think about this here. And so he's waited almost halfway through the letter before he's brought up the name. Everybody ever bring a name up to you and you, I mean, immediately become angry? Anybody ever bring a name up to you and immediately your first reaction is... Mm -hmm. I mean, so you could be having the best day in the world and somebody mentioned that name and all of a sudden, I hate him. Kind of reminds me of Ahab. Remember old Ahab and Jehoshaphat staying around there and they want to go to war? And Jehoshaphat, and they said, well, bring in the prophets. Let's see if we're supposed to go to war. And they bring all the prophets in there and they're running around. One's got a set of uh, horns from a bull and he's running around. You're going to push them down with this here. I mean, they were great. I mean, uh, great entertainers. I mean, but it was to the point to where Jehoshaphat, after they got done with their, old, their whole, uh, uh, you know, ecumenical service there, they got done. And finally, Jehoshaphat said, can we not get a man of God in here? Can we not get a prophet of the Lord in here? And Ahab said, um, yeah, there's one. His name's Micaiah. Yeah. And I hate him. <laughs> Just to even have to say the name. Of course, Micaiah was put in jail because he did. He told Ahab, you're not coming back alive. You're going to be killed. <laughs> I mean, but that was the word of the Lord. And so he wasn't going to lie about it. But that was that man. He brought that name up. He brought Micaiah up. And Ahab's immediate response was, oh, I hate him. But that, that's almost the place here we find with, with Onesimus. Uh, no doubt that name was a name that was not exactly a name to be bantered around in the, in, in the company of Philemon. And all of a sudden here, Paul brings him up. I beseech thee, watch this, for my son. Did you catch that? You know, Paul says that about other people in the Bible too. Timothy, my son. Hey, what does that indicate to you? Well, what, obviously Paul was not married, and so he did not have this child. Okay? So that's not what he's talking about. Rather, it's one... Paul was used the Lord to bring Onesimus to Christ. This is my son. Uh, my son in the faith. Uh, 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 Philemon, you're looking there at this young man here. I know what you think, but I just want you to know he's my son. Do you love me? If you love me, you'll love my son. If you would do good to me, you should do good to my son. And so notice there, and I can almost see, you know, maybe see... Philemon looking like your son, Paul says, whom I have begotten in my bonds. While I was here in jail and I couldn't go out and travel the, the world like I was doing, I couldn't go out into the streets of Philippi or the streets of Corinth or Ephesus or, or go up there to Athens to the place where everybody met. I'm stuck here in jail and I can't get out and witness everybody, so I just got to sit here and I got to wait for God to bring people by. And yeah, there's, there's guards from Rome, uh, from, from a Caesar's palace, and I've led a few of them to the Lord because we know we're at the end of the book of Philippians. He says, those in Caesar's palace greet you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, Paul was like, I just sit around in here and I got to wait for God to bring him to me. And he brought this young man to me, Onesimus, a runaway uh, slave. And he showed up here. Notice, hey man, I got to give him the gospel and he got saved. I'm so thrilled that God let me bring somebody to Christ to point somebody to Jesus Christ. And, and, and Philemon, I just want you to know, he's my son in the faith. Oh, so we, we got a brand new person here now. See, the man that left Philemon, he was a scoundrel. The man who's come back to Philemon, he's a new man. 
And so that's why Paul wants Philemon to get, uh, there's a new son in the faith. And then also notice this here, he doesn't stop there. Look at verse 11, which in time past uh, uh, to thee was, uh, uh, to, to thee unprofitable, now profitable uh, unto me and, 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 and to thee. He's profitable to you too. Listen, Philemon, you've got a, if, if he's my son, he, you know what he is to you? You got a new brother. Now, for some of us, we know that is not very appealing right there because we know how some of our relationships with our brothers. But this is, that's what he was appealing to. Listen, I've got a new son here, but, but Philemon, listen, I, I want you to understand that uh, you've got a new brother. And listen, I know he was unprofitable before, but right, he's profitable now. This is ironic in, in, in some ways, but the name Onesimus actually means profitable. That's the name of his name. That's the meaning of his name is profitable. And I can almost see as Philemon dealt with that young man before, before he ran away and thought, you do not live up to your name. But now all of a sudden he's, he's, he's proven himself in the company of Paul there. Where Paul says he's a changed man. He's now living up to the name that he has. Uh, Philemon, I want you to think about this here. I want you to think of this here. He is a changed man. By the way, as, as Onesimus is bringing this letter, there's another man with him, Tychicus, who's bringing a letter to the Colossi church. And in that church, uh, they're, they're, they're reading these verses here in, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. The Bible says, Servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Onesimus had proven to Paul the change made in his life, and Paul was convinced that Philemon would see the same change in Onesimus if he gave him the chance. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, listen, Philemon, I know in time past, I know before he was unprofitable, but trust me, he's profitable to thee and to me. Why? Because when the Spirit of God brings about that new life in a person, there should be outward evidence seen by those around them. And we can use the excuse sometimes of, well, that's just the way I am. You know, when we say something like that, all we're saying is this, we're not walking the Spirit, and we're not letting the Spirit have His way in our lives then. What we are declaring to everybody is this, I'm living in sin. That's what we're saying. That's just the way I am. No, you're supposed to be dead to yourself. You're supposed to die to the flesh. You're supposed to be living in the Spirit. And there's going to be a change in how, how things happen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If something is going against what the Bible says, or we're living in such a way that goes contrary to the Word of God, that means we need to change, and we need to die to self, and we need to yield to the Holy Spirit. That's what needs to happen. And what Paul was saying to Philemon was, listen, Onesimus has gotten saved, and I've seen the proof of salvation in him that all things are, uh, are passing away, and behold, all things are become new. He's a different person now. Question, are we different than what we used to be? Can you see a marked difference in your life from what you used to be before salvation to what you are now? You say, well, I got saved at a young age. Listen, you know before you got saved, you were a selfish creature. You lived for yourself. You wanted your way, and you didn't care who got, who got hurt on your way of getting what you wanted. But listen, there should be a change in our life and there should be evidence in our life that we know that we're acting different because we've given our life to Christ. And listen, because of that, listen, because there was a change in Onesimus, what Paul was looking for from Philemon was a different attitude, a new attitude towards this young man. See, salvation changes everything. Salvation not only changes the young man or the young lady who gets saved, but it's also supposed to change our attitude toward them. Because no longer are they an unbeliever, no longer are they on the outside. Now they are a brother or sister in Christ. 
The relationship has changed, if you will. As mentioned earlier here, runaway slaves were usually dealt with very severely. As I was reading uh, through some of these things here, it was amazing to see what some of these, uh, these slave owners would do. There was a story of one who, who he would take his, if, if one of his slaves uh, did something wrong, he would throw them into a, uh, this giant uh, uh, pool full of man-eating fish. Talk about a jerk. Talk about it. I mean, severity there. I mean, uh, the crucifixion was on the, uh, was, was possible. Scourging was possible. Uh, I mean, uh, he could put him in prison. There were so many things that were available at his fingertips that he could do. And that was the environment Oness was, was going back to. But listen, Philemon, you're saved now. You're different now. You're not like everybody else. Uh, everybody else around you is an unbeliever. You should handle this thing differently. If Christ truly had been received by Philemon, and obviously it had. The testimony of Paul at the beginning of this book here, this little letter, gives us clear evidence Philemon was a believer. There needs to be a difference in how Philemon is going to handle this situation. As believers, we need to have a different attitude as well. We need to handle things differently as well. Paul was urging Philemon here to act as a Christian believer, not as a Roman patrician. And we listen, we, we got to change our mindset in some things. I'm a Christian first, and everything else follows behind. Amen. And we need to get that in order. We, listen, because listen, if Christ is preeminent in our life, it will affect every area of our life and everything that we do. And that is what Christ wants. And He wants to reign supreme in your life. To where He's the one who says, no, this is how we're going to do it. Uh, here's how we're going to take care of things. Uh, here's the attitude we're going to have uh, with this here. And so we need to be careful with this here. And so Paul lays out a plan. He's got a plan. Here, here's what Paul's original plan was. What he would like to have done was this. Uh, he, uh, he had proved so profitable to Paul. Paul wanted to keep Onesimus. That says a lot. Look there at verse 12. Talking about Onesimus, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. That is mine own bowels. He's got my heart. Uh, Philemon, he's walking. My heart is walking into you. Onesimus, that's my heart whom I would have retained with me, that in thy study he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. And maybe Philemon was saying in the back of his mind, I wish you would have kept him. But notice what Paul says, but without thy mind would I do nothing. That thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. Again, Paul could not pick up the phone and have a conversation with Philemon about this. Say, hey, this Onesimus guy, I already used to be with you. Well, can, you, can, you know, can I keep him over here with me and literally a servant to me? And I, I got a feeling Philemon said, please do. Please do. But he says, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going, to, I'm going to send him back. But I just want you to know, listen, he's been profitable for me in the ministry. Now think about that. Paul says Onesimus was profitable. Can I just tell you, Paul had a high... High bar. Remember John Mark? Yeah. I don't want to see that joker again. He's a quitter. I don't want anything to do with him. It took John Mark uh, uh, several years before Paul finally said, uh, send John Mark. He's profitable to me now in the ministry. Yeah. It took several years and here's this Onesimus. I mean, in just a short amount of time, he has proven himself here. And no doubt Philemon is thinking, him? Really? And Paul's like, you don't, you wouldn't, you, you could not believe the change in this young man. And Paul could have spun it in such a way that Onesimus was serving him. And Philemon said, since he could not be in Rome, and, and he could have uh, pressed that issue there. He said, I'm going I'm to hold on to him. He's going to be in your stead to me. All, I mean, he could have done all those things there and made it sound real spiritual. But notice what Paul says. Without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. What if Paul just wrote the letter and said, hey, you know, I met this guy on Nespus, I'm just going to keep him with me, man, he's been really profitable to me. Hey, do you mind if he just stays with me? Finally, you're like, what am I going to say to him? What am I going to say to Paul? No. 
Paul said, I could have done that. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, Paul uh, wanted to raise the, the bar here. And he wanted to make sure uh, here that uh, things were done right. Listen, doing right was more important than convenience. It was more convenient for Paul for Onesimus to stay with him. But he said, not without thy mind. Paul refused to presume upon the kindness of his friend. But notice here as we close up and we wrap up tonight, I want you to see one more thing here in the last couple of verses we're going to look at this evening. And that is this. It's Paul's a, trying to get Philemon to see the eternal perspective. That it might be that the reason why Onesimus left was for a redeeming purpose. Did you see that in verse 15? For perhaps. Now, Paul is not presuming that he knows God's mind, but he's saying maybe by the providence of God, God allowed Onesimus to leave your house so that he could find me. And by coming across to me, he would hear the gospel once again. I don't doubt that Philemon and his family and no doubt the members of his church had shared Christ with this young man. But for whatever reason, he chose not to listen. But now he's found himself a thousand miles away from home in the city of Rome. And he comes across the Apostle Paul. And as he comes in the Apostle Paul's presence, Paul begins to ask him, Hey, has anybody talked to you about Jesus Christ? And immediately I could see Onesimus go back to Philemon's house. Oh, yeah, 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 I know about him. I can see Paul as he begins to preach Christ to him. And as he does, the conviction of the Holy Spirit falls on that young man. Perhaps, Paul says, perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. Well, what a perspective, right? What a perspective he had with this here. We often think of Romans 8, 28, don't we? Um, you know, all things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Hey, I know this was not in your plan. I know this wasn't what you were thinking. But listen, maybe God allowed this to happen so the purpose that he would trust Christ and get saved. Maybe that's what's going on here. Remember what God said in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9? He said this here, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so Paul here says, listen, it was by, I, I, perhaps by the providence of God, He's moved Him here so that we have Him, not just for a little while here on this earth, but we have Him for all eternity now. See, there, was a, there wasn't just a providential purpose in this here. There was a permanent purpose. There was an eternal perspective that he wanted him to get a hold of because he left. Listen, look what happened to him. Uh, Paul points out that he departed for a season that he might receive him forever. Now, because of that, Paul says there needs to be a change. I, I didn't write the reference down. I should have. I think it's in the book of Psalms. Maybe it's in the book of Romans. It's one of the two. But there's a phrase that says this here, in honor, preferring one another. In honor, preferring one another. What Paul is about to call upon Philemon to do is to take him from looking at him as just a slave and raise him up a level to a brother. If you will, bring him up to preferred status. Because look what God has done. Notice what he says in verse 16. Not now as a servant, but above a servant. See, that's all he was before. He was just a servant. But notice what God has done. Uh, he, he, he's changed this young man. He saved this young man. And now, listen, Philemon, look at him differently. He's not just a servant, but he's above a servant. A brother beloved. Philemon. You know what the test of your Christianity is? By this shall all men know that you are not my disciples, if ye have. You kind of got to do it, Philemon. You're not going to, he's beloved. If you have love one for another, Jesus said. Their relationship had been elevated because of Jesus Christ. Notice here, beloved, especially to me, and watch how Paul turns this here, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. 
Paul or Philemon, you've known this young man for many, many years longer than I have. I've known him for a short space. You've had him for a while. You've known him. How much more should you be rejoicing now? You should rejoice more than me. And he's really driving this home, isn't he? You re listen, there should be a love for him. Uh, our human relationships pale in comparison to the bond we have in Christ. The problem is for us on this earth, we too often let the earthly overshadow the heavenly realities he wants us to live in. We're so caught up in all the little things around here, there, and everything else, and we forget to take a step back and ask, is that a brother in Christ? Is that a sister in Christ? Then I'm supposed to love them. I'm supposed to love them. So we close up tonight, give you four things from this section of verses for us to think on. Number one, love is the best motivation for our service. It's the best motivation for our service. Paul said, I could have I required, but I don't want to. I want you to do this out of love. Out of love for me, but more importantly, out of love for the Lord. Listen, our service, whatever we do, needs to be driven by love for Him primarily and love for others secondarily. The first commandment, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. The second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. If we get our love right this way, our love this way will be a whole lot easier to get. Number two, a believer should be a changed individual that others can see the change in. Listen, if you're saved in here, there should be a difference. There should be a difference in you compared to everybody else around you if they are not saved. There should be a different way, a, how you handle things, a different attitude. I didn't say it was easy because in order for that to happen, i got to die to myself. And I don't like that. And I need to walk in the Spirit. And that's a little hard because the Spirit and the flesh over here are warring against each other. But listen, i got to die to my flesh. And I've got to say, Lord, have your, have your way. Number three, we should deal ethically with one another and not assume something is okay just because we go to church with them. Be careful that you don't take advantage of one another. Well, uh, they won't mind. Uh, they're a Christian. They'll forgive. Uh, no, 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 no. Paul could have taken that attack and said, well, you know, I, I, I'm the apostle, so I just, I just made an executive decision. I just figured I would keep him. And he said, I'm not going to do that. He said, I will do nothing without you knowing full well what's going on. Dealing ethically. We should, that, that, should be a, that should be a hallmark of us Christians, uh, that we deal ethically. Number four, and lastly this evening, we need to view everything through the lens of eternity. Everything needs to be viewed through the lens of eternity. Perhaps he left, and I know you're upset about it, but perhaps he left so that we could receive him forever. I don't know why things happen. I don't know why we go through some things. I don't know why we have some heartaches that come into our life. I don't understand why we have some losses sometimes. I don't understand every situation, but I do know this. God is in control. Amen. And God has a purpose in everything that He allows in our life. And while I may not ever understand on this side of eternity, I need to just go and look to, to, look to heaven and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with this. Paul was trying to get Philemon to have an eternal perspective. See this through the lens of eternity. Everything we do needs to be seen through the lens of eternity. Father, help us tonight.